Okay. Um, so this is everyone's opportunity. If you have a question for Aditi, pop it in the chat box. I loved all those tools that you shared, all of the links, especially the beautifultrouble.org one. I'm going to explore that a little bit more. That intrigues me. Spectrum of Allies, Toolbox. Um, yeah, I always am looking for new resources and and things to add to my toolbox to help with discussions. I think it's important to remember that most people come with good intentions and most of us want yeah. a better future and being able to articulate that and describe it um, to each other is so important. Um, and that's where I think the SDGs are helpful because everyone might have one SDG that is a priority to them. And then maybe we find out how our work can be mutually beneficial. Yeah. And we may have the same priorities, but using different language to articulate yeah. them. So then we're just sort of like on the same page, but not reading mm -hmm. the same direction or the same uh, alphabet in a metaphorical sense. <laughs> and uh, I think that's what the SDGs were set out to do, right? Give us the yes. common language, because if we can at least agree on language, then maybe getting towards targets and indicators of success is a step easier. In library school, we call that a controlled vocabulary. Mm, controlled there's, vocabulary. There's the library terms for you. Take that. I like that. Um, we have a question that's also sort of just a conversation starter. I'd like to hear more about the local climate reality activities, such as the book readings. So you've got, yeah. we've got Airtable and Climate Hub li links in there. Do you want to talk about those a little bit more? Sure, I'll mention the book. I'll just put a link to the ch in the chat about the book we're gonna be reading over the summer and the fall. Um, the book Love is it. called The Day the World Stops Shopping. So someone had mentioned responsible consumption as the SDG that was important to them. So I would say this might be the book or the book club for you. Um, so this is by um, Bill McKinnon. And I feel like I should know where Bill McKinnon came from. I feel like he's been around a long time um, in climate action. Um, but he's an environmentalist and the book is about ending consumerism, how ending consumerism saves the planet and ourselves. So that'll be the, the book that we're, it's the first book club book that we're doing um, as a hub here in Saskatoon. Climate Reality Canada and Climate Reality in the US has have led book clubs in the past and I've been involved. And that was really cool. One of them was about, um, it was actually a novel. It was called Speaking to Water, I believe. I'll find the name. Um, but it was really interesting because it was about environmental racism. And so it was really fascinating to learn um, as a group. And I don't know much about the black experience in America, um, but it was an insight into what environmental racism looked like there and being able to draw, you know, comparisons to Canada and how um, people, how communities have been clustered or segregated or removed from mm -hmm. access to water, access to land, access to that biosphere, to that wedding cake layer, that bottom layer. Um, so when we think about exclusion and who's benefiting from environment uh, policies that pertain to the environment, it was really fascinating, a good opportunity to chat with folks, most of whom were white settler women, and I would say between 50 to, to 80 years old. So it was really an opportunity for all of us in the room to think about what that experience was like. And there were a few um, people who identified as black who shared what their perspectives were as well. And so reading about black environmental racism in the US was something that climate reality offered me that I would, would not have had opportunity to participate in before. Interesting. I love that. I There's sort of the stereotypes and the prejudices that come with um, being black in America. And I remember a news article a few years ago about um, an NFL player who left the NFL and then bought a farm and started farming. And everyone thought it was like this great novelty. And, and just what's at the root of that is a sort of a racist assumption that black people don't farm. They're not farmers. Farmers are white. So that's an interesting kind of um, lens to look at environmentalism through too. Um, yeah. 
yeah, I'm and we another have book right now. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. We have copies. I will just say, I looked it up. We have copies of J.B. McKinnon's book at the library. So, and there's two available in Saskatoon right now. Always, you know, support the author and buy your book club books. But if you can't, I'm just yeah. going to probably duck downstairs and grab the Francis Morrison copy as soon as we're done here. So, <laughs> so there's one copy in Saskatoon. Got it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. Okay. Um, you'll have to put it on hold, but yeah. It looks good. Um, Anang or um, someone comments in the chat reminds me of how Africa, going back to what we were talking about, uh, mm -hmm. Africa and other third world countries are the least contributors to climate change, but are disproportionately impacted. Yes. Yeah. And, and the and genocide of Canada with the indigenous population, they were the stewards and the keepers that had that relationship taken away from them. And seeing environmentalism through their lens braiding sweet get grass is another great book i'd recommend yes, i have that yeah right here actually i'll make a little plug the um, university of saskatchewan has a sustainability fellowship program and our six sustainability fellows are all reading this this summer and going to be unpacking it so yeah. we are so thankful to have that i love and i highly recommend the audiobook actually to anyone who's yeah, she reads this it the, she reads it herself yeah. and she's got a lovely voice sometimes those audiobooks you just you're not quite sure if the author no, should read them yeah, yeah that one and it's gaining momentum like it came out a few years ago now but people are picking it up and reading it and it's mm -hmm. it's great Yep, I'm very thankful to my former colleague who I mentioned earlier, Tracy Laverty. We were on a road trip going up to learn about Indigenous plants. And she said, you've got to listen to this audiobook." She was like, it's the best audiobook." So huge props to Tracy for putting me on the path to um, listening to that audiobook a few summers ago now. Um, to, to the comment in the chat about, um, you know, different countries who have, who have contributed less to climate ch change. Um, and who are now being asked to reduce emissions, there is a tension there because there are countries who say, well, you had your chance to develop, now is our chance. And we will just, we will adaptation. We're not even going to try to mitigate because this is our chance to thrive and thriving to them is set on the, on, on a different, on what the West or what um, colonial superpowers dictated as thriving. Right. So, you know, success is every family having a car in some places. Um, when here, we would argue that families maybe don't each need a car. Um, so who are, but who are we in the West to say, you can't have what we've had? And I think that's the tension of, you know, we, we can't just say what we think is best um, for the Americas and expect everyone else to to follow in line so that is a tension in the climate reality world or that is a climate reality in itself yeah there's um i have a friend who uh put it very eloquently once where she doesn't own a car um not because she wants to you know shirk her responsibility or be an irresponsible adult but because her sense of responsibility is elsewhere she feels it's the responsible thing to do to not drive you know um but you're i i like that counterpoint too where if you are um in crisis or uh under a certain umbrella of poverty a car would be really helpful <laughs> you know mm -hmm. so there is a, a sort of a different scale of responsibility for different people there are communities that are underserved by that social layer of the cake of the wedding cake that's so the social infrastructure that that's don't it. have busing um and so we see that in saskatoon we don't have intercommunity busing um, readily available or commuter options um, so someone that's living in Martinsville or Warman or Aberdeen, what are their options to getting to employment? And so survival and protecting your family um, becomes most important and doing that by driving is your solution. So what are the policies that we're going to advocate for to change that? Maybe we want 
uh, more EV infrastructure. I believe you have a talk on EV coming up in a few months. Um, so, you know, what electric vehicle infrastructure could look like for those um, small commuter small commuter communities. Maybe that's one step, at least in the right direction, even if we would rather see um, high-speed trains everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, that luxury of a metro system. Mm -hmm. um, that's a nice segue um, to perhaps I'll invite Carol up now virtually to share some of the details about this fall.